Welcome to the Lunch Hour Special Series, where we deep dive into the world of Mexican drug cartels and the ongoing troubles along the United States southern border. I'm your host, Joshua Trevino. I'm the Chief of Intelligence and Research at the Texas Public Policy Foundation in Austin, Texas. And our guest today is Jason Jones. Jason, welcome. Uh, Jason is a retired captain from the Texas Department of Public Safety's Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. He has supervised human intelligence operations in multiple nations, including leading the longest 24-7 border operation in Texas history, Operation Secure Texas. Thank you for that as a Texan. His investigations targeted Mexican cartel leadership, built programs that collaborated closely with U.S. intelligence, and helped save lives in both Mexico and the United States. Jason, it's really a pleasure to have you here today. Well, it's great to be with you, Josh. Thanks for having me. I understand that you have just returned from the garden spot of the U.S.-Mexico border, Lukeville, Arizona. Tell me why you were there and what you saw. Well, that's a good way of putting it for sure. You know, I, I went to Lukeville because of the West Africans that had been surging in that area, and I wanted to be able to really understand what opened up that vein to get them coming through that area and why we see thousands of them now. And I'll tell you, I, I, you know, I've got some incredible videos that I saw, but one of the things that's happened is that uh, Pallone, who is running the Sinoita uh, Plaza just on the other side of Lukeville, Arizona, who's a Sinaloa cartel uh, plaza boss for that region, He's working yeah. with long haul smugglers. He's moved them in. And now they're opening that vein up. You've got up thousands upon thousands of West Africans pouring into that region. And I'll tell you, I, I watched it back to back, Josh, as uh, these guys are crossing in groups, usually from as small as 13 and up to 50. And it's stunning. It's stunning the speed with which they move it really is. Tell me about the uh, several questions I want to ask following up to that, though. But tell me about the line, the system, the method that they use to get from West Africa to the Arizona border. That's a long trek and it's organized. Can you give us some insight on uh, what you learned? Yeah, they, they work with long haul smugglers. They're just flying them in. They fly in either to Mexico itself or they fly down into Ecuador and then they work with alien smuggling organizations and what I call the underground Uber that basically just passes them off right up to the border. And then the Sinaloa, for, what, for whatever reason, has opened up this vein in the Lukeville area. And they were going all over the country. I mean, I talked to a group of 13. They were going to Memphis, California, and to uh, New York City. So mm -hmm. that, that vein is real. The other really interesting part of it is I didn't see any women and children with them, just single males. Now, that could be because of the, you know, the length with which they've got to go. But I couldn't understand the granularity of that. But what I can tell you is that the Sinaloa cartel is charging between 500 to $5,000 per person just to cross from the Mexico side into the United States. That's it. That's just, that's just for the crossing. That's not for the whole journey, obviously. Th that's exactly right. Just to cross through that border wall. And what, one of the things that they're doing out there, it's really interesting, is the alien smuggling organizations that are moving them there uh, who work for Pallone, they're literally going in and they're cutting the border wall. I've never seen that kind of cut. They'll do a, a, a cut on the bottom piece and another cut on the other side of one of the ballards. And then they'll go right. in at the very bottom of it. They'll cut it across and they'll go through the metal, the cement, and through the rebar. And then they'll take a truck chain and they'll pull it back. You can move 50 people through it in a matter of a minute or two, Just close it back, and you have no idea that it's there. It's incredible. How long, how long I mean, from, from, from arrival to, uh, to uh, folks slipping through, I mean, how long would an operation like that be? Is that, is that 10 minutes with, uh, with good tools or is that a half a day? To How cut through it, to cut yeah. the cut itself. It depends on the yeah. tools they're using. I talked to a lot of the guys who are actually doing the welds on our side because there's welding mm -hmm. crews. Literally, they're doing so much of the cutting. The welding crews are going through and they're just welding back all day all of the cuts that they're making. So it's a it's a constant 24-7, 365 cut, uh, cat and mouse game that they're playing. But what the actual time frame is, I don't know. What I can tell you, though, is I drove by an area. I came back around in about a five to 10 minute time zone. And where sure. we, I had seen no one, there was 50 guys sitting there when I came back through. Amazing. Amazing. Same way <laughs> it's you'd be stunning. Was that their, yeah. was that their, uh, their, their approach? So, 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 so these are folks typically, they want to be picked up. They're going to get the, the NTA and then just vanish. Yeah. Vanish Those are the give ups. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. They're, that's uh, not the runners. Them. No. Uh, well, okay. So, so tell me what differentiates the, and by the way, for our audience, I apologize. An NTA, can you explain that uh, before we go any further since I just dropped Yeah, sure. The, yeah, you bet. Those are people who, who come in, they turn themselves into U.S. Border Patrol, then they're issued what's called an NTA or a notice to appear. And then based on what city, what state in the United States depends upon how long they have to wait before they sit down and meet with immigration. 
and right now we're talking about a time horizon of sometimes years, right? It's not it's not that yeah. I've noticed in a few weeks. Oh so yeah, absolutely. It, and that all depends on how busy the current location is around the country, where it is they're going. You know, one one question I have, uh, I'm I'm much more familiar with with uh, Latin American and and Central American and Mexican migration for the most part. And of course, there you've got a system where uh, all over generalized, but this is this is mostly true. Uh, you know, you get enmeshed in the trafficking network, you end up in the United States. Uh, but then your trafficking journey is not over, of course, because once you're in the United States, you're sending remittances back that effectively right. get garnished if they're not directly to the trafficking organizations. Uh, how does this work with, with uh, you know, they call them OTMs other than Mexicans? How, how would it work with your West Africans, for example? Are they doing something similar where they're providing a revenue stream for the traffickers once they're in the U.S.? Yeah, they are the Border Patrol agents specifically in Lukeville. And, you know, every alien smuggling organization is different. So I can only speak to what's happening in Sassabee and Lukeville based on the debriefs that I did. But uh, I can tell you that once once they cross, before they allow them, let me rephrase that, before they allow them to cross, they've got to pay at least half of that fee up front. And these are the runners now. These are not the give ups I'm talking about. Once they okay. make it into the stash houses, what Border Patrol was telling me is that's where they demand either the other part of the fee or when they get to their destination. And then, as you just described, they pay that remittance back to the cartels on the Mike side, on the Mexico side. It's, it's uh, you know, to, to, to draw an analogy, it's almost uh, a subscription model of human trafficking, isn't it? You know, you lock in the customer and then they're paying in increments essentially forever uh, once they get to their, um, once they get to the location. That implies something though, uh, because of course, you know, these individuals don't stiff the traffickers once they reach wherever they're going, Chicago, Detroit, Dallas. Um, uh, that means the, uh, or that implies at least that the trafficking organizations themselves have uh, the ability to enforce in those cities across the United States. Is that an accurate perception? It is. And then here's the other problem is why isn't the Homeland Security Enterprise explaining the TTPs or the techniques, the tactics, and the procedures by which the cartels and the smugglers are doing this. See, they didn't have that network, uh, Josh. This is the real story, that, and this is why I get so frustrated with the leadership of the Homeland Security Enterprise and why they are who I really focus on, because this is the communication that they should be telling the American people. Historically, you know, domestically in this country, we always looked at the cartels as these drug traffickers, right? So they had that logistics and that network using their Halcon network who controls our border and they're leveraging U.S.-based street gangs and tier one gangs to distribute a lot of their, their uh, narcotics. Well, under what happened, you know, with this mass migration surge that we saw in the last few years, the Gulf Cartel was the first that we really recognized this when in February of 21, they began moving men, women and children and putting so emboldened, they're putting wristbands on them. I broke that story. But what the Gulf did that was really interesting, the Gulf Cartel specifically I'm talking about, they began sure. putting their operatives in with these people when they would cross. Then they would get them on buses that paid for by U.S. taxpayers shipped throughout the country. And so what we did is we sent this new virus of what we call debt bondage, which is what you're referring to. Where these right. people were now indebted to these cartels, they pay a local guy who then sends those remittances back. This is America's new slave trade. I mean, yeah. we have to be very open and very honest. You know, we can call it debt bondage, we can call it human trafficking, puts a little better spin on it, but let's be very frank, open, and honest. They are indebted to criminals who really should be terrorists in a foreign country for years, if not decades, to come. But what's really interesting to me is about how fast these these organizations move to be able to put these people all throughout our country to make sure that they collect that debt because they didn't have that capability before. It was a drug-related nexus that was always separate domestically in our country from the immigration issue. And that's why I'm always so frustrated with how the media and many in the Homeland Security Enterprise are illuminating what's happening at the border as just an immigration issue. We, it, it has been far beyond an immigration issue at our border for many decades now. And it's time the American people realize what's happening. When do you think, I mean, you've kind of provided an answer, but uh, if I could drill down a little bit on that, when do you, when do you think those two streams merged? Uh, illegal immigration has been with us for, for years and years. Yeah. I'm a South Texan, uh, so, you know, I've seen it. Uh, uh, but, 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 you know, I think you and I both agree analytically they're like the streams have merged, the criminality and, and, and the migration issue are uh, effectively one and the same. And we have to deal with it predominantly as a security issue, first and foremost, uh, when, when did that happen? When did we cross the bridge of no return on that, on that, uh, synthesis? Yeah, we know that February of 21 was when the real, the real evolution from the smuggling to the trafficking occurred for the cartels and for what was happening in Mexico and, you know, Central Americans as, or Central America as well. 
But the real tectonic shift that occurred that really was missed by the U.S. intelligence agencies was 2006. And I talk about this all the time. This is when the cartels went from organized crime model into the insurgency. You know, I was a narcotics agent back then, and I can remember these gun battles taking place in Rio Bravo, right, right along our border, where the cartels yeah. were truly fighting back against the Mexican government. You know, in some of their most elite special forces, Josh, they were leveraging 50 caliber belt fed machine guns, RPGs, light anti-tank weapons, hand grenades. And we were stunned. I mean, absolutely stunned at what we were seeing. And yet none of this was getting out because where was our focus as a nation? Well, it was on Middle East terrorists at the time, you know. And yeah. so this allowed for that rise. And then I saw the mass murders of Mexican citizens, you know, you, and migrants. You may remember the San Fernando attack in 2010. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, and I could go on and on, you know, look at the Allende massacre of 300 men, women and children. Uh, you know, uh, we were doing everything we could back then to rescue a lot of these migrants by sharing intelligence. And that's what some of these things on the back of my walls were all about rescuing migrants in Mexico from the, the Zetas who were so violent. And then really where we see them today, and I'll just close out here by saying uh, as truly a parallel government, those initiatives, those changes uh, then spawned what we saw in February with the human smuggling into the trafficking as they just began, you know, spreading out globally. You know, this is not a U.S. Mexico problem. Americans need to understand that you know, these cartels are all over the world, Sinaloa in 54 countries, Carta Jalisco, New Generation in 48. And, and that's the real tectonic yeah. shift that's taken place. Well, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've been watching what's been happening in Ecuador, right? With the, uh, with the Joneros, which is a, which is a yep. Sinaloa, effect, right? And so there so it I is. Great example. Exactly. Great example. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I want to I want to uh, pull on something you just said here, uh, you know, describing the Zetas uh, as, as a parallel government. This is something that at the foundation we've been working on uh, quite a bit, making this case that the cartels themselves are essentially, if not parastate, then certainly sovereignty bearing uh, organizations uh, and that they exist um, uh, frequently in cooperation with the Mexican state itself. Uh, do, do you agree with that thesis? Disagree? Um, qualify it? I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how would, you, how would you characterize the Mexican state in particular now? Uh, is it a friend or something else? No, I wouldn't call it a friend. I, I really wouldn't. Uh, I don't think that's a fair analogy anymore. Um, you know, we have to be very open and honest. CNN did some of the some great reporting um, on what had taken place in Mexico during the last national election. I ask anybody that's watching to pull this up. Uh, 132 politicians and staffers were killed in the last national election in Mexico. Now, think of that for just a second. That's nothing new. This has been happening for a long time in Mexico. So people will tell you that the cartels, you know, they have no ideology. They're just drug traffickers, blah, blah, blah. No, drug trafficking is something they do. They truly did seek power and they did take it. They just use proxies to do it. And we were so stuck in, you know, outdated definitions of what terrorism truly is. Look at what they've done to the Mexican people, Josh. I mean, they've been allowed to kill over 400,000 Mexican citizens, just according to Mexico's own data since 2007. That's mm -hmm. not real. I can tell you as somebody who knows how they collect the data down there. Um, look, there's, yeah. there's been some major tragedies that have taken place down there. And look, why isn't it being reported? People would say, well, you know, they've, they, they've killed their journalists. Look at the journalists being killed in Mexico. So that's why when I retired, I'll be very frank with you. I went public because I don't look at Mexico as a partner right now. I think there are people fighting for their country. There are great people down there in the government. There are people that I know for a fact that want to partner with us to fix out and rule, rub out the corruption and do what needs to be done. But in a holistic look right now, I think Mexico has some serious challenges. I think the United States has to look at where it really is and start going after and rooting out the corruption down there and being a partner with Mexico. I want to be very clear on that. I, I'm not one of these guys that will tell you that we go at this alone. Absolutely not. I'm a big believer in collaboration and uh, collaborating with the Mexican government is how we win. I'm a big believer in that. What's the basis for that collaboration, though? Uh, I, I want to push you a little bit on this point because uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's sure. I, I think a lot of it's key to some of the policymakers who may be watching this. Uh, uh, if you can't if you can't appeal to to Mexican and tell me if I'm misinterpreting you, if you can't appeal to Mexican office holder or Mexican state, uh, say basic decency or even self-interest, uh, then what are the tools by which you generate that fruitful cooperation with, yeah. uh, you know, whether, whether it's AMLO now or Claudia Scheinbaum uh, after right. December? That's well said. Well, first off, there are a lot of people in the military who are ready to defend their country against all of this. I can tell you that. But they have very, very clearly, they will say it privately. 
that they are, they're, you know, they're on the back burner right now. They can't do what needs to be done and literally waiting for the next administration in Mexico to come in so that they can do what needs to be done. So there are good partners within the military. I want to be very clear on that. Second, there are partners in uh, political, the political side of Mexico as well. And we have a lot of leverage with them. Now, how do we have that leverage? We have that leverage through one thing, and that is through commerce. I mean, we've got to be very open and honest. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars are crossing our southern border every single day. I think some could articulate billions. And that's where we have a lot of leverage. The other part of this is that we can't wait, Josh. I want to be very clear here. We lost 112,000 Americans from May of 22 to May of 23 to overdoses in this country. Most of that, over 70% directly linked to fentanyl. I, yeah. I want to be very clear here. I know the cartels very, very well. They will not stop. They're going to have to be stopped. Would you would you say uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so push back if I'm if I'm misinterpreting you? But it sounds like you're you're in favor of linking commerce and security. Is that is that accurate? Uh, absolutely. Look, you know, NAFTA has been a great thing for our both of our countries, right? Let's be very honest there. But one thing that was never really initiated, and we have to be very upfront and honest, is that you know if you're going to have global prosperity, you can't look at global trade and say to you, well, don't think that a global crime problem doesn't come with that. And so those mechanisms were never put in place within NAFTA to ensure the protection of both countries. And we've seen the rise of the cartels all as a direct, and I don't want to say all, but um, part of that rise in, in global trade. So we've got to really take a look at what we're going to do next to start fixing what has happened and what's taken place in Mexico. Uh, you know, we, we've seen, uh, and again, speaking for, for, for my organization at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, uh, we, we've seen some pushback uh, from folks in governance, well-meaning folks, by the way, this is not impugning their motives, yeah. uh, on yeah. linkage of, of, of trade and security, this idea that you shouldn't do it, uh, that you've got, you've got security on one track, you've got trade and commerce on the other, and to intertwine them would be unnecessarily destructive uh, to both sides. Um, uh, how, how do you answer something like that? If somebody says to you that uh, that linking the two will, uh, you know, take your pick, offend the Mexicans, it will impoverish South Texas, on and on. Any any excuse you can think of. Uh, how, how do you answer that? Well, first off, to directly talk to some of these politicians who don't know, and I and I will tell you, you're talking to someone who has traveled the country. I've briefed them both privately and I've briefed them publicly, both at the mm -hmm. state level and at the federal level. What I have found, Josh, is that they d truly don't understand what has taken place in Mexico. That's the real truth on it. Do you know the very first question I ask now leaders that I sit down with privately? When was Tell the me. last time you were briefed, either classified or unclassified, by anyone in the U.S. intelligence agencies about what has taken place in Mexico with these cartels? You know what the answer has been? 100 Probably. Well, 99% never. never. One guy said, Jason, I was briefed. He was a senator. He said, Jason, I was briefed one time. And the guy that briefed me was a CBP um, official from the Reagan building who hadn't worked the border in 10 years. <laughs> this is where we truly are. Now, look, okay. I, don't, I don't cast any blame on the left, and I don't cast any blame on the right. I, what I have learned, my God, Josh, they're asking for briefings. They can't get them. So yeah. where, I, where I'm going with that is that's why we're doing what we're doing. I, you know, I, I'm traveling the country trying to illuminate what has taken place and have real open, honest dialogue. And what I have found is stunning. If you're on the left, you get most of your – your news from either MSNBC or CNN. That's your intel collection. And if you're yeah. on the right, they tell me Fox News. This is That's where we are from our government. So you know, like you just said, I don't hold anything against them. What I realize and recognize is somebody that worked in the Homeland Security Enterprise, somebody that tried to save lives in Mexico and has worked hard to get the tools and authorities that we need, which is why I started the whole initiative to designate the cartels as terrorists, because I realized utilizing a law enforcement model, we can't win at that. And that doesn't mean we go to war against the cartels. What it means is it gives us the tools and authorities to truly have success. Uh, that, that's exactly what I wanted to pivot to. Uh, I can prove it by holding up my notes before the camera, but I won't. I was going to ask you about foreign terror designation for Mexican cartels, which, which again, is something that we favor. Uh, and I, I suppose you do, too. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you want that to happen? Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I retired in June of 2016 and I went public and I was stunned, uh, first off, just so you know, that, that nobody wanted to hear it. I, I was surprised. And uh, the reason that we've got to have the tools is because the law enforcement model, uh, it was never designed to take on the world's problems. It was designed, our system 
was designed under our Fourth Amendment to move very slow, uh, to make sure that law enforcement crosses every T, dots every I before they go after someone domestically in our country. When you start going after people in a foreign country utilizing the Department of Justice, you bring a whole new layer of things that slow us down. So what do you get by designating these cartels as foreign terrorist organizations? Well, first and foremost, you can't be a terrorist in this country. And what would stun most of your viewers is that most of these cartel operatives that are here, remember, they have money, Josh. They can go get a visa. So we can revoke their visa. And if they're on the, the watch list, I can remove them from the country very quickly. Second, we remember, this is not a U.S.-Mexico problem anymore, as you just very clearly outlined about what's happening in Ecuador. This is what I've been screaming about. Now what this allows us to do is to limit their mobility globally because now we can put them on watch lists. You can't fly anymore all over the world spreading your poison. And so that really limits their mobility to Mexico. And then third and final, you always hear this from these pundits on national television, and I laugh about it. They say, well, you know, we've got to go after their money. Josh, no shit. We've only been doing that for 20 years. But what's never been explained properly to the American people is that our system by design moves very slow. So with the terrorism designation, now I can, outside of the United States, which is where we need to target them, go after yeah. their assets real time and truly eliminate their ability. I don't, I don't talk structure to the cartels very, very much publicly, but what I will tell you is basically they're a dark network. And if you notice, the law enforcement model targets leadership. Or when you go with a terrorism designation, you would target the network. And I won't say who in the network we target, but what I will tell you is basically key nodes, because I don't want to give our adversary, when we do come for them, uh, anything that I may be, you know, what the process will be. Of course, of course. No, I completely understand. Can you, uh, you know, t talking about that international angle, and uh, th this is actually a topic you and I have not previously discussed, actually, so I'm curious uh, what you think about it. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of talk. Uh, uh, about the increasing centrality of China and the PRC uh, to yeah. not just in the provision of fentanyl precursors, but also an active involvement with uh, with a lot of the cartel activities throughout the hemisphere, throughout the Western hemisphere. Do you have any insight on that, uh, kind of what your thoughts are on, on the PRC? Well, it's been going on a lot longer than uh, just fentanyl. Uh, those integrations are so much within the Sinaloa cartel. We know of Chinese operatives that have literally married in to the cartel and are you know, currently purchasing massive amounts of chemical precursors from Mexico. And if you really think about how long this has been going on, I mean, if you look back to 2007, when we seized hundreds of millions of dollars in Mexico from a Chinese uh, businessman who was directly linked to the cartels, that, that was the first real indicator as to how the Sinaloans began moving in chemical precursors for methamphetamine. They just evolved into NPP and 4A NPP from China. But the story that's not told to the American people is how now the cartels have now gone around China to work with, you know, India, Bangladesh and Pakistan to get in their chemical precursors. So while the federal government just pounds away at China, and I have no problem with that. I really don't. You and, and but where the issue comes is where they say China, China, China over and over again. But yet the cartels who are cooking the dope, right, who have the logistics working with the Halcon network working with the alien smuggling organizations, working with U.S.-based street gangs, tier one gangs in the U.S., they have the distribution network. So like right now, Ann Milgram with DEA is the administrator is saying, we're going to embargo these ships and we're going to stop these ships from bringing in these chemical precursors before they hit Mexico. It sounds right, right? I mean, it makes sense. But when sure. you realize the breadth and scope of how big the cartels have become, what they've begun doing and how they hired chemists right out of universities to manage all of their labs, how they weaponized it, then moved it from regular fentanyl to parafentanyl to serafentanyl, and now mixing in the zine categories of xylazine. You know, they truly weaponized it, not China. And, uh, you know, so I, I, while I make, you know, I don't take away anything away from what China has done or and is doing working with other criminal networks. Look, let's be very open and honest about China. They're the best at non-conventional warfare. And they saw what the uh, what happened to them with the opioid epidemic in China could do to their own country. They knew what it would do to ours. So we have to just be very open and honest about that. But I will tell you the failure of the federal government to recognize the breadth and scope of these organizations and how they are collaborating all over the world, Josh, is the main failure point because they're working with state actors, non-state actors, Middle East terrorist organizations. You know, that's what cartel means. A lot of people forget this. Cartel just means agreement. That yeah, it's just been right. bastardized, you know? That's so, right. and I, I think what you said earlier, I give you a lot of credit. You said, look at Jason, what is happening in Ecuador? 
with that gang working directly with the Sinaloa cartel. That's a great mm-hmm. example of just the breadth and scope of what these cartels have become, whether you're talking about the Mexican cartels and all the others down to South America. You know, you know, talking to uh, uh, talking to almost any level of Mexican officialdom, uh, you'll you'll inevitably encounter, uh, and and we've encountered it at a high level, this narrative that they have that the reason that they can't beat their own cartels uh, is because the Americans send so many guns flowing south. Uh, I've I've sat in the uh, the SRE building in Mexico City and and uh, had this narrative uh, told to me. Uh, I personally find it uh, it's probably my demeanor indicates not credible. Um, but, but, but if you disagree, tell me if it is, I'm sure you've heard it. What do you think of that? And, uh, to, you know, to, to what extent the, 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 there's gotta be some truth buried in the lie. Uh, what's the, what's the true part of it? Well, I've heard the same thing. I, it, I was laughing because in, it was 2011 or 2012, we sat down with six or seven generals from, uh, Sedena who came sure. up to, to a headquarters and I'll never forget it, Josh. The very first question they asked is, Gentlemen, before we get started, can you tell us what your involvement was in Fast and Furious? Mm. And yeah. we were like, hey, we want to be very clear. We had nothing to do with Fast and Furious. So it validates yeah. your point. A legitimate what, question from them. That's right. From the yeah. Mexican perspective, that is their fear. So what everyone needs to know, and this is somebody that studied this when I was in Intel and Counterterrorism specifically, because there was a time in 07 as the violence was really wrapping up, Josh, that there was a lot of criticism that weapons coming from Texas were, were supporting the violence along the frontera. Yeah. And what we found is that that wasn't a lie that, you know, look, let's be real open and honest. We make some of the finest weapons in the United States, but the weapons that we make that are going south are the weapons that any uh, American under our Second Amendment can go to any gun store and buy. The story that is not getting out to the American people and that the Mexicans truly don't want to acknowledge is the military grade weaponry coming up from Central and South America, where Guatemala yes. and everyone else around the world is purchasing military grade weaponry legally through legal means. They go to right. Guatemalan uh, armories and Mexican armories because Mexico has great relationships, with, not only with our country, but around the world. They buy those weapons legally, but then through corruption. Those military-grade weapons are moving north, supporting cartel operations. Now, I'm not thinking that. I want to give the validation there. Um, ATF does what we call trace data. And so they, when when weapons are seized in Mexico, specifically military-grade weapons before they're detonated, they run those serial numbers. So we know where they're coming from. We know in detail. The problem is there's a narrative out there that if it wasn't for those Americans and their weapons, Mexico wouldn't have the problems. The other thing that Americans need to know and many people in your audience, is that Mexico has some of the most stringent gun laws in the world. They don't want weapons going into their country. And so, look, I don't blame them. But one thing I would tell you is that, look, if that's their laws, that's their laws. But what could we do in, in, in the relationship side of this that gives us a lot of leverage to work with our federal law enforcement agencies to really you know, limit the amount of weapons going south. And we can do great negotiations with the Mexicans on that to really build some collaboration and go after these cartels and help them be successful. And this is really where we see uh, kind of return to return to one of your previous points, um, uh, organizations like the Setas or in Guatemala, the Cabiles, which started out as as formal military units. Right. Uh, yeah. And so and so, so both the Cabiles and, and, and the Zetas were um uh, essentially special forces equivalents within the Mexican and Guatemalan armies, uh, respectively. And they have these links and the institutional knowledge to know where the armories are, who's running it, what the, what's in the armories and so on. And, uh, and that, that's the real pipeline, uh, for the, for, for the weaponry that matters. Is that right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I we debriefed many K bills and, uh, along with, uh, Gafe special forces who are collaborating, um, with the Zetas, uh, and now that's evolved all over the country of Mexico. Um, that, that relationship and those relationships have go back that I know of personally since 09. So the FARC, matter of fact, if you may remember the first, um, car bomb that cooked off in Juarez in 2010, that was a FARC designator, um, that, that cooked that off. Um, so that trade craft, yeah, the trade craft directly linked to the first car bomb in Mexico was directly linked to the FARC. We made that through ATF. I, I had ATF agents on the ground in a matter of hours and we were collaborating, trying to understand what that mechanism was because they filmed it. And you got to remember at the time what was happening, well, Middle East terrorist organizations were doing the same thing. So they just took that entire process, brought it here, and then immediately uploaded it through their propaganda cells. But what I would tell you is that you're absolutely right. The FARC 
uh, K-Bills and those relationships also brought trade craft and discipline. Um, major game changer within organized crime, because at the time, um, you know, they truly were organized crime, but then they brought train the trainer programs in and then began conducting basic intermediate and advanced training. I mean, Josh, I'd sit down with young, young Sicadios and they would call themselves commandos. They really? truly yeah. believe themselves to be commandos. Because they'd had that training from that's real right. command. Right? That's oh, exactly okay. right. That's exactly okay. right. Okay. You know, you know I, this is getting a little bit orthogonal, but I just, I mean, I, mean, I have to ask, uh, uh, and, and, and I genuinely don't know the answer to this in a Latin American context. I know that in, in lives past, when I was uh, engaged on the health side uh, with, uh, with African governments, one of the, one of the issues that, that generated uh, corruption and I'll say institutional freelancing was uh, insufficient pay in conditions in the civil service. Does that drive... Uh, armed forces personnel into cartel service uh, in the Western Hemisphere that you've seen, or is it something else? Yes, absolutely. No, no doubt. I, I'll tell you a great story. Just you talk about how broke local and state and federal law enforcement were in Mexico. We were we were on a wiretap listening to Lascano. I don't know if anyone's familiar out there with who that was. That was the leader of the Los Zetas. Uh, okay. I targeted him along with Miguel Trevino for years, and they had stopped a group of local law enforcement officers and they were surrounded them and they asked the boss over the radios, Hey, what do you want us to do with them? And, uh, he, he, he responded, got there and he let them all go. Do you know why he let them all go? They didn't even have bullets in their guns. So when you talk mm-hmm. about how poor and how underfunded, undertrained, uh, a lot of the local and state law enforcement were at the time. Now this is years ago, obviously, right? I mean, lots has changed in Mexico. This is what drove a lot of uh, the GAFE to originally leave and go to work for the cartels. And now you see that everywhere. You know, the Zetas were a game changer in that regard. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. Mo- a matter of fact, most of the cartel leaders uh, were former local, state or federal law enforcement or soldiers in the government of Mexico at one time. A lot of people are not uh- aware of that. I believe that. Well, as viewers of uh, Netflix's Narcos Mexico know, uh, Felix Ariano was a cop, right? Before he uh, established it's very common. The- yeah, it's very common. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Very common. Right, right, right. Thank you for mentioning that the uh, that the Zeta leadership is uh, inundated with Trevinos. Uh, we're we're trying we're trying to make a better name for ourselves uh, on, <laughs> on, on on the north side. Uh, l- let me ask you this: the the th- this is rewinding a bit. You mentioned uh, 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 Polon, uh, who I guess is running the uh, the plaza uh, at uh, where Sasabe is that right? Uh, Sonoita, Sonoita, across from Sonoita, Lukeville, I'm Arizona. Yeah. Okay, okay, uh, across from Lukeville. Um, for the benefit of our listeners who don't uh, who don't know, uh, can you can you talk through the, the the plaza system real quick and how that works? Because it's a very interesting yeah, sort yeah, of good franchise point. model. Yeah. Yeah. No, they call them plazas down there. Here we call them municipalities. But basically the way it works in the criminal underworld is that a plaza boss is assigned to a municipality all over Mexico. But really, let's just stick to the front there along our, our border region. What, what, what everyone needs to understand is that those townships like Matamoros, Reynosa, because we're from Texas, I'll just spit, stick to Texas, you know, all the way up over to, to Juarez. They're extremely lucrative. But they are the front lines from the cartel's perspective. They are the front lines. So let's say you are a Gulf cartel member or you're a Los Zeta member and you work further down in the country in Mexico, but you make a mistake. They will literally send you to what they call the front line. And the plaza boss, his job is to control everything that moves in and out of there, legitimate goods, illegitimate goods, and to tax it, to put a tax on what they call the piso or the tax. Mm -hmm. That means if it's a person, a child, dope, they don't care. You know, you're always hearing they're drug traffickers, and it goes back to what I say. No, drugs is something they do. It's not what they are. So that right. plaza boss controls everything. He also pays off all the officials. You know, they pay off all of the uh, military officials as well to, you know, hey, don't, don't mess with us. Go mess with those other guys. We're just doing business here. And so that position is a very, very important position because it's really the, the hierarchy that makes – this is where the real money is made within the organizations, just so you know, Josh, from there up. And so yeah. the plaza boss has a very, very important role, uh, not only on the uh, political side of it, but also on the enforcement wing side of it. And that's why you saw a lot of them create these entire enforcement wings to regulate and control other cartels. What, what your viewers really need to understand from their perspective, they don't fear their government. They don't even fear our government. What they fear are their rivals. So the plaza boss is very, that position is very important to gain revenue 
but also to keep the bad guys away, if you will, as they act like they're the Robin Hoods protecting their communities. You and I have have, uh, have, have had some conversations uh, about a topic that's near to my heart, which is what Texas can do to protect itself. But let's uh, let's expand the aperture a little bit since we do have a national audience for this particular podcast. Um, uh, what what should states be doing? Set aside what the federal government ought to do, or uh, which is mostly a list of things it's not doing uh, at this point, in my view. But uh, what what can what can the four border states do right now uh, uh, operationally to to secure their border against this threat? Well, when you say secure their border, we have to recognize first off is that states right now anyway, don't have really the authority to stop the immigration issue. They just don't unless they declare an invasion, right? Invoke the the constitution as Governor Abbott has done. And yeah. now we're going to see how this plays out. It's about to go to the U.S. Supreme Court with the new law. And I, I think it's great. It's going to set the standard for the long run. But let's get away from the immigration side. Just look at the crime side of it. Sure. Um, the big thing that I think we have to recognize is that we can't rely on the federal government as states any longer. I mean, we have been dealing with this as a state of Texas, for example, for decades. Enough is enough. We have spent billions and billions of dollars. Now, one of the things that we can do is collaborate with the Mexican government much, much better. You know, the state of Texas has incredible capabilities, incredible resources, and we need to maximize that collaboration on a law enforcement side and intelligence sharing side. That's one of the things that really is a missing piece to it. And I tried to implement that at a much bigger level than what we did working with US intelligence agencies. And a great example of that is the NYPD. New York after 9-11 sent their detectives all over the world. And they were working with frontline, whether at local, state, or federal law enforcement all over the world, depending upon what country had what various uh, efforts. To me, that is a huge gain in the security forum of uh, protecting Texas and protecting our nation, because now you have people on the ground who are willing to collaborate. It's a long story. I won't go into the failures of the FBI here. You know, we can do our own thing there. But that allows for one on one communication between law enforcement in Mexico and the U.S. Second, uh, we have to recognize that we have really hit a threshold here. You know, Governor Abbott's Operation Lone Star has done amazing, amazing things. Mm -hmm. But we've got to be very frank. Our Texas National Guard is exhausted. The Texas Department of Public Safety and the uh, game wardens, they're exhausted. We've, we've really pushed this to a whole new level now. And so we've got to recognize that we need more capabilities there. The last part of this is that we've got to have some accountability from state to go to the government of Mexico. Look, you know, if you're not going to do what needs to be done, one thing that we saw that Governor Abbott did that I praised him publicly and I still say it privately and I'll continue to say it that he did, was when he started conducting uh, safety inspections down at the ports of entry, look at what it did. It brought the Mexican government at state and federal level, every state along the Texas border came to the table to work with the governor. I, yeah. I will say it again, again, when it comes to trade, we have a lot of things we can do to work with them, including stopping weapons going to Mexico. We can truly work with them on that. And I think that that's one of the big gaps, Josh, that has to be fixed. Uh, between the state and Mexico. And there's that linkage of trade and security that we talked about earlier, showing yeah. itself effective. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And we've got proof uh, of it. We know what works. We've got we proof do. now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. Well, uh, I mean, thanks to th thanks to folks like you who've been uh, proving the concept for quite a while. Uh, well, one last substantive question, and then we'll, and then we'll turn to the close of the show. And thank you for your again your time uh, on this, Jason. It's it's, it's extremely helpful. Um, uh, you, you've mentioned areas uh, and 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 people, broadly speaking, with whom we can cooperate in Mexico. Uh, individual office holders, elements of Sedena, elements of Samar, the Army and Navy down there. Um, uh, what do you think of the approach that uh, Texas has taken of actually liaising with individual Mexican states, state governors, uh, you know, perhaps municipalities in some cases? Uh, is that fruitful or do we need to keep that cooperation uh, as much at the national level as we can? No, we, we need to do it at every level. And we need to really fix what we've done in the last, you know, few, few years. Look, I'll, I'll be very frank with you. Our relationship with Mexico determines the success and the protection of the American people, period. It does. I, I mean, we have to be very open and honest about that. And the more we get away from collaborating, working with the Mexicans, the more uh, not only instability in our own country, uh, to our own citizens, but also to theirs. And, you know, we all have great resources that we can leverage and we haven't been. And that's what I'm truly trying to do. I will tell you, Josh, and I mean it to the very core of who I am. These cartels are the biggest threat to the American people. That's not a perception. That's not a feeling. 
they are responsible for the death of 112,000 Americans. We have to be very open there. And look, we could do a whole show on this of how they go into communities and create that uh, addiction. But, you know, and again, another story not told to the American people. But I will tell you this, and I mean this to the very core of who I am. We have to get this authority to designate them as foreign terrorist organizations. We've got to work with our partners in Mexico. And not, not only that, you create a, what, what, what I call a unified command globally with partners all over the world and absolutely crush them for what they have done to so many Mexican citizens and so many American citizens in, in our two countries and really around the world. Amen. Uh, Jason Jones, uh, public speaker, Southern border expert, great Texan. Uh, really appreciate your time. Can you tell us where we can find you uh, online and elsewhere? You bet. You can find me at jasonjones.com. That's J-A-E-S-O-N. A little, little different spelling there. Uh, jones.com. I'm also on social media, but I'm also on Newsmax almost every day. That's right. Uh, and, and not just there, but also uh, where everybody is seeking counsel uh, for, uh, for our border and for the cartel issue, there you'll be. Uh, so again, uh, thank you for it. I'm Joshua Trevino. This has been the lunch hour special series uh, focusing on, uh, the Mexican cartels and border security. Thanks for joining us.